It seems to me the urgency of, of those incentives has increased as well because now there is a sort of a, a broader international feeling that, um, you know, and, and, I, and, 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 and correct me if I'm wrong here, but when we saw this bombing of, of Raqqa, it was basically uh, the international community saying, uh, now that uh, 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 France has been uh, attacked, now that, uh, and I guess would, uh, to some extent, uh, Lebanon and, um, and Russia's plane being downed, there is a greater uh, tolerance. I mean, it's horrible to put it this way, uh, but this is, I think, the way that they, they perceive it. There is a greater tolerance for civilian casualties as a function of uh, coalition bombs, if you will, and, and, and therefore the sort of the the level of urgency has in, in increased, right? I mean, because uh, it, there, there's like a, a broader license for the international community, even with their own domestic audiences, to, uh, to get more, even more aggressive. Look, prior to the last several weeks, and I think this, this still remains to a large extent, but each side in the Syrian civil war, the regime and the opposition, has said, back me, and that is the way to defeat ISIS. The government has said, back me, and that is the only way to defeat ISIS. The opposition has said, take out Assad, support us, that's the only way to defeat ISIS. Um, and the French and the Russians have been on completely different sides uh, of that, um, uh, that division. With the Russians supporting the Assad narrative, you need to support Assad, to destroy, the, uh, to destroy ISIS, and the French saying we need to support the opposition to destroy ISIS. And in the last several weeks, what we've seen is that ISIS has struck um, in spectacular and devastating fashion against the pro-Assad Russian government uh, by destroying that, that plane in Sinai that was carrying uh, Russian, the Russian plane, um, and uh, attacking a neighborhood uh, in uh, Beirut, in Lebanon, that is thought of as one that is very sympathetic to Hezbollah, which is also very much pro-Assad. And they attacked in the heart of France, in, in Paris, in a way that was very much uh, aimed at sending a message to, to the French government. So suddenly, these uh, two major players in supporting uh, the, the different belligerents in, in the Syrian civil war find themselves on the same side of the receiving end of violence from the civil war that's rooted in the civil war that they previously could ignore. That, that's not the case anymore. Right. Uh, and I, I think what, what they've realized is that the, the, the bickering, what essentially amounts to bickering um, and what essentially amounts to political posturing between the two uh, parties in the war about what's the way to defeat ISIS by backing, you know, one side or the other, um, has, has really allowed this civil war to continue and has really allowed the conditions uh, which um, uh, allowed ISIS to fester um, uh, continue as well. So w what I think has to happen now is that these players need to look at the situation and say, listen, we need to find a way to bring this to an end, this civil war to an end, because as long as it continues, uh, as long as there's no Syrian entity that's willing to take Syrian territory and govern it in a responsible way, ISIS is going to be there and ISIS is going to spread. And I mean, in some way, it's been a game of of chicken, right? Where they where everybody's just hanging in there um, because the costs are probably uh, less to them directly. Although, you know, uh, and just saying like, w I, there's no reason for us to ultimately... Uh, focus on ISIS per se, uh, because we still have an opportunity for our guys to to prevail at the end of this. Yeah, and, and you know, unfortunately, uh, it's the people on the ground, Syrian right. civilians, who are who are paying the of highest course. cost for this for this line of thinking. Syria has essentially become a meat grinder, uh, and, and there it does not make any sense. Uh, and, and you know, in this situation, you have major regional and global powers that are backing different sides of a proxy war. Uh, and really, we're, we're not seeing any signs of a, a, a clear winner here. Uh, 
Uh, and, and, you know, at, at some point, people have to look at the situation and say, you know, the costs don't justify the, 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 the potential ends here. Right. But that becomes, that becomes very difficult uh, to say to your constituents, if you're the opposition or the government, when you've already shed so much blood in pursuit of those aims. Um, but, you know, at, at some point, cooler heads have to prevail. At some point, people have to say, this has got to stop. There's no unconditional victory here. There's no unconditional surrender here. Uh, and, and the players that are on the outside that are starting to get affected by ISIS now, um, I, I think, have to look at the situation and say, we have to push these parties towards an agreement. Um, and there has to be a realistic expectation that n not everybody's demands are going to be met. Um, at the table. Are we uh, close? But getting to are, yeah. are, are we close to that? I mean, are we starting to see like you know today? Apparently, um, uh, Sergey Lavrov uh, said, um, or I guess this, yeah, this was today uh, that uh, you've got it to, to the West. You've got to drop uh, the Assad demands if you want to unite against uh, Daesh or the Islamic State. Uh, is that it, 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 is that something that we're starting to see, or uh, is there some uh, indication that there's a deal like, okay, uh, for now we drop our uh, Assad issues, uh, and, uh, you know, the Russians may say, well, and we'll deal with Assad, uh, we promise to deal with Assad, as long as we still have a client state at the end of this. Well, I think we are closer to that than we've been in the past. I'm not sure we're close yet. Um, but I, but I think the conditions are starting to develop uh, to to push the players in that direction. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of things that I would point out. Russian intervention. Um, you know, it, it's very easy for the the Russians to talk a big game, but the longer they're involved in Syria, um, the the more costs are going to pile up, both in terms of what it costs to mobilize military there, uh, and and also any casualties that they're going to take. Um, and the, the, you know, the Russian president has been able to, to somehow um, maintain strong approval ratings um, despite a, um, a really crumbling uh, economy. But uh, if Russian bodies start coming home from Syria, that's probably not going to last very long. Does this, uh, and, you know, I'm sorry, does this, does this problem migrate to Iraq uh, if... If, if it is in some way contained in Syria, I mean, which is not to say, obviously, that it's not in Iraq now, but it seems like there is some uh, measure of, of stability in terms of the, uh, the, the battle lines. And I wonder if um, it, it does this, if, we, if, if, if Syria is somehow, at least the fighting is at least somehow mitigated, and uh, you do not see civilians getting caught in this meat grinder in the same way. Uh, do we see some type of uh, escalation uh, in Iraq? Because it seems to me at that point, right, uh, the Iranians would would come in and help uh, 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 fight ISIS in Iraq more aggressively. But then I think the Saudis would then, yes, start to say, well, wait a second, <clears throat> we need that bulwark again. Well, I think the, the big key here, um, and, and it's important to understand that the challenge that we're talking about is an asymmetric threat. This is a non-state actor. This isn't, you know, Nazi Germany. This isn't the Soviet Union. Um, you know, while the, the, the president, you know, used the language JV team, uh, which, is, which is regrettable, um, we're, not, we're not talking about the world's greatest power here in right. ISIS. Um, if, if, if everybody effectively got together to resolve this, it can be resolved rather quickly. I just think the political will has not been there on the part of all the players because they're holding out to maximize their gains and the other moving parts of, of this situation. But if you are able to bring a resolution to Syria, I think you go a long way toward resolving the Saudi-Iranian contest. Um, which, which really is uh, the key variable in uh, solving Iraq as well. Um, there needs to be a uh, broader shared vision between the Saudis and the Iranians about how stability can be maintained in the region. Right now, they're on completely different, you know, in completely different universes about this. 
Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the, the Saudis are being driven by a degree of paranoia, um, in part because of what took place in, uh, um, in Iraq and, and the removal of, of Saddam and the, um, you know, the collapse of the Iraqi state, but also because uh, of the Arab Spring. Uh, and uh, the uprisings that, that took place in places like Bahrain, in places like Yemen, in places uh, very close to Saudi Arabia that really challenged the Saudi theory of government, which is um, a, a, essentially monarchy uh, and legitimacy through, through, um, uh, through heredity. Uh, and, uh, you know... Uh, that has to change, and that's one of the things that has to change in Saudi Arabia is that, that vision about what creates stability and how you achieve stability is radically different than how um, many people in the region think about what needs to happen. Um, I guess, so again, I guess what I was asking yeah. was, it was that, I mean, it seems that it's one thing to sort of put that, uh, that proxy war on hold in the context of Syria, but that doesn't necessarily, and, and this is not to say that, you know, ISIS, it, it seems, I mean, clear that ISIS exists at the sort of the, the will or the lack of will to resolve uh, the issue of ISIS because it's a, um, you know, it is in the context of, of this, of this uh, broader regional conflict. Uh, and I just wonder if it gets if you can resolve that uh, at least the the Syrian civil war and those agendas still don't necessarily go away. Uh, it's just that they are getting pressured by various other parties, Russia, let's say, United States, Europe, uh, to resolve it in Syria. But it, then if it migrates back over to Iraq, you still have this this broader, um, uh, conflict between the Saudis and, and the Iranians. Um, and if it doesn't, you know, their energies then go into to, to that region. But, but let me ask, in, in that context, uh, why, wh why would um, uh, some type of partition be more problematic than what we have now? Well, I think most Syrians don't want it. Uh, which is which is a pretty significant obstacle. Um, that's number one. Number two, how do you impose partition? Right. Um, that that's got to be done on the ground uh, as well, and that's going to mean determining where the lines are and putting forces on those lines uh, and, and ensuring that the people on the other side of the line respect it. Um, and you know, uh, doing doing that is a recipe for conflict creation. Uh, I don't know how long it would last, but the idea that, um, you know, it's going to be uh, conflict-free, I think, is, is, is fanciful. Um, and with, with the uh, particular situation that you have in Iraq and Syria, where you have so many interests, so many moving parts, so many ethnic identities, uh, many people with different uh, claims uh, from the Alawites to the Sunnis to the Shia to the, to the Kurds, it's going to be very easy to see how there are going to be several players who are unhappy about any line that you draw. Um, and part of the reason that we're in the mess that we're in in the Middle East is because of badly drawn lines that were imposed on the region by people from the outside. Um, so I, I think continuing to do that is not a, um, a long-term solution, and in the short term is not going to be conflict-free uh, either. So what uh, what can we look for? I mean, what would give us an indication that uh, at least the majority of the parties who have been uh, unwilling to to really uh, to really, I guess, we put a full effort into ending uh, this the this civil war in Syria um, uh, for hopes that their side would would win? What what would what would be an indication that perhaps those attitudes have changed? I mean, what would we begin to see? Well, um, you know, the, the good thing, if we can call it a good thing here, is that the parties on the ground are highly, highly dependent on outside support. Uh, both um, the, the rebels and the government um, really need outside support to achieve uh, their, their basic demands and to continue um, fighting in the war. 
Um, and I think that um, if we start seeing the bigger players uh, demonstrate a commitment to resolving this, um, then the players on the ground will have no choice but to fall in line because their capability to continue waging the war um, is, is not going to exist anymore. So we're, we're going to need to see the bigger players that are backing the parties, including the Russians, including the French, including the Turks, the Saudis, the Iranians, commit to uh, ending the hostilities. There's going to have to be some sort of ceasefire that's going to be imposed. It would be wonderful to see a arms embargo and to see the parties stick to an arms embargo uh, and to actually then create a negotiations process for how to have a new functioning government uh, in Syria that does not include Bashar al-Assad. Um, and and that's, that, that's a tall order, but again, um, it, it's hard to envision any other path out of this. Yusuf Manea, uh, writing in The Nation magazine, thank you so much for your time today. really appreciate it. Great to be with you.